For Grace Cass, Ukraine was home. Sure, it could be unwelcoming for a black woman, and she would never get used to its bitterly cold winters, but it's where she had lived for the past seven years. The 24-year-old, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, had come to Ukraine's second-largest city of Kharkiv as an engineering student and stayed on, forging a successful career as a makeup artist. She knew its parks and fountains. She learned Russian and some Ukrainian. She made close friends. In a word, she belonged. This was not just a place where I lived. I was making something of my life. Cass says, finding it hard to hold back tears in the train station of the Polish city of Pramizl, on the border with Ukraine. So now they say we have to walk all the way to Romania. Can you imagine? So that's what we are doing. It was Monday evening and she had fled Ukraine overnight on February the 27th, the fourth day of a full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine. She made it out just in time. A day after leaving Kharkiv in northeastern Ukraine, the city was bombarded with Russian rockets that killed dozens of civilians. But when Cass reached Lviv in Ukraine's west near Poland, joining the heaving crowds desperately trying to board trains for safety, she says she encountered hostility from the Ukrainian military, who were dividing people into two groups, those who were white and those who were not. They said uh, they, uh, they had a protocol for the entry to the border, and the protocol was, uh, you know, 10 number of the Ukrainian Ukrainians. locals to uh, one number of foreigners, foreigners to gain entrance to the uh, Polish. Polish border. Did a border guard say that to you? Yes, a few of them. The lady who works with the border guard said that. We are not allowing any black people to enter inside the gates. We are students! We are students! At first, blacks were, it wasn't like that. We were all moving together. That it got to a time, blacks were somewhere else and other, let me say, other white color skin were also somewhere else and they were actually moving a little bit faster. The blacks weren't going at all. Did they separate the queues? Yes. So black people were in one queue and white people were in another queue? Mm -hmm. And when it was time to get on this bus, the Ukrainians said, just Ukrainians, literally as a black person, I even lied that I was pregnant, they didn't care. I was begging. The official literally looked me in my eye and said in his language, only Ukrainians, that's all. That if you are black, you should walk. And that was an additional eight hours from where we were. By car, it was like 30 minutes. So we had to walk additional eight hours. The problem isn't, as, isn't at the Polish border, it is at the Ukrainian border. And the Ukrainians are only prioritizing their citizens. They don't care, they will push you, they will beat you. If you can make it, you make it. If you don't, you don't. We entered the train last, Cass says, describing how she and other African women were forced to wait outside as snow was falling, while white women and children were allowed to board before them. She believes her gender is the only reason she was spared being beaten. Groups of Nepalese, Indian and Somalian men described to Time, a major media outlet, how they were kicked and beaten with batons by Ukrainian guards who later begrudgingly allowed them to cross over on foot. Later, when Cass's train stopped for 17 hours at the Polish border, this is what she says happened. At the Polish border, Ukrainian train guards gave out bread and sausages to passengers. But they passed us, myself and all the fellow Africans there. And by the time it was our turn, they just threw us the ends of stale bread. After spending more than a third of her life in Ukraine, Cass felt let down. It was a traumatic experience. This is merely a spill of what it feels like to be black in Ukraine. Kindly sit back and review with us in this journey where we unfold experiences relating to this sad reality. Support our efforts by staying with us as we grow together. Like and share video with friends and families to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative and subscribe to keep getting notified. We're glad to have you with us. Let us delve in further, shall we? Human Rights Watch, HRW, an international non-governmental organization headquartered in New York City that conducts research and advocacy on human rights, had some years ago reported that racism and xenophobia remains entrenched problems in Ukraine. When Ukraine gained its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, scholarships to African students substantially decreased. However, African students still found schools in the area appealing and today, over 16,000 African people are studying in Ukraine, accounting for more than 20% of Ukraine's international students.
And although the pathway to a visa in Ukraine and less expensive education costs are appealing to African students, economic depressions in southeastern Europe had resulted in the rise of anti-immigrant prejudices and racial discrimination against Africans. Following a series of race-related murders of Africans in 2007, Ukraine had, if not hesitantly, passed anti-racism legislation. And although hate crimes tended to decrease then to a certain extent, that reasonless feeling of hate and racist behavior continued to persist against black people from Ukrainians. Still, Africans would always report regular occurrences of racial prejudice and name-calling like monkey. In 2012, the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, ECRI, reported that tolerance towards Jews, Russians, and Romani appears to have significantly declined in Ukraine since the year 2000, and prejudices are also reflected in daily life against the black communities who experience problems in accessing goods and services. From the years 2006 to 2008, 184 attacks and 12 racially motivated murders had taken place. In 2009, no such murders were recorded, but 40 racial incidents of violence were reported. It is worth considering that, according to Alexander Feldman, president of the Association of National and Cultural Unions of Ukraine, people who are attacked on racial grounds do not report the incidents to the police, and police often fail to classify such attacks as racially motivated, and would often write them off as domestic offense or hooliganism. A 2010 poll conducted by the Kouros Institute of Political and Ethnic Studies, UK, showed that some 70% of Ukrainians estimated the nation's attitude towards other ethnic minorities as conflict and tense. The discrimination African refugees fleeing Ukraine faced is a recurring reminder for those who believe in a post-racial world that anti-black racism is alive. Humanitarian crises, whether man-made or caused by natural disasters, often create intense suffering and societal divisions, and therefore call for a show of extraordinary humanity and solidarity. When the war in Ukraine broke out, Africans and Afro-descendants were as outraged at Russia's act of aggression and stated as much from different policy, political, social, and economic vantage points. They expressed equal humanity through their solidarity. However, as many fled the advancing Russian troops to safety across the Polish border, something tragic began to unfold. A recurring reminder for those who believe in a post-racial world that anti-black racism is alive. Not only has the Russian invasion of Ukraine brought to light the awful tragedies that accompany armed conflict, but the subsequent refugee crisis has also uncovered deeply-seated racism in the country. Reporters documented dehumanizing treatment against international students from Africa, South Asia, and the Middle East in Ukraine. This treatment also extended to racialized permanent residents of Ukraine, including a long-time practicing Nigerian doctor. Like Deja Vu, the world watched as Ukrainian police denied black and brown people the automatic and unconditional entry into Poland, a right granted to everyone else who was fleeing from the war in Ukraine. Some African students reported being shoved off the trains leaving for Ukrainian borders to make way for supposedly more deserving white folks, while others were harassed, beaten with sticks and slapped, having their jackets torn, being forced to go to the back of long queues by armed security officials. The scenes captured on social media were both horrendous, heartbreaking, and infuriating. Olympic gold medalist serving as Ukraine's first black member of parliament, Jan Baleniuk did speak openly about the racism he has faced in Ukraine, after bringing home the Greco-Roman middleweight gold a few years ago in the Tokyo Games. Ukrainian wrestler Jan Baleniuk was the sole recipient of a gold medal on his team during the Tokyo Summer Games in 2021, but his welcome back home was anything but warm. Baleniuk, who was born to a Rwandan father and Ukrainian mother, won the gold in the 87-kilogram Greco-Roman wrestling event. The achievement marked a personal milestone for Baleniuk, who had previously taken home silver during the Rio Games in 2016. But on August 13th, the year before the Ukraine-Russia crisis, 30-year-old Jan Baleniuk had shared on Facebook that even with his golden accolade, he was not exempt from racist attacks. Baleniuk had sadly stated the following. A few minutes ago, young men unknown to me approached me in the center of Kiev, Pechersk, trying to provoke a conflict, shouting out abusive things like, Black monkey knows something about patriotism, and go to Africa. Thank God it didn't come to the fight, so I'm okay, but one, I wonder if I am Ukrainian for my state, what criteria of patriotism exist in it? Two, how safe can the Olympic champion feel in his homeland and in his hometown? Three, 
And is it normal in the European state to hear offensive things to people who put life on its glorification? More than 60 years earlier, James Baldwin had argued that you cannot be a black person in America and not live in perpetual outrage. Even so, Ukraine was not the first time in a crisis that black people and other people of color have been treated differently. There were similar shocking incidents against Africans in China in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic when some Africans were forcefully screened for the virus and forced to self-isolate in hotels, while other Africans were evicted from houses that they were renting by their landlords and denied services and goods. In the antebellum south of the United States and within the apartheid and color bar systems in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Angola and Mozambique, black people were referred to as the great unwashed, backward, uncivilized, impish, etc. This stigmatization and criminalization of blackness sadly remains a phenomenon in both the global north and south, such that the imposition of travel bans by the global north after the discovery of the Omicron variant by South African scientists was, and is, in fact, travel apartheid. Almost immediately after the announcement had been made that a new variant of COVID-19 Omicron, as it was later named by the World Health Organization, had been identified, wealthy northern nations had rushed to impose travel bans on a number of southern African countries and later on other African nations as well. In some very unpretentious language from African governments, the move was labeled racist, hypocritical, unsupported by science, travel apartheid, and even swart gavar particularly because these same northern states did not impose similar bans on each other, despite their infection rates being hugely higher than the infection rate in southern Africa. Going forward, systemic racism has a critical ally in a complicit international media that either invisibilizes black suffering or suggests that the injustices consistently visited upon black bodies are secondary to defeating the Russian threat. Racism and white supremacy existed before and will most likely continue after the Ukrainian crisis. It will take much more than Twitter outrage and sanguine statements by the African Union and some African countries. The fact that Ukrainian refugees and other Europeans were being welcomed into Poland and migrant-hating Bulgaria without any conditions demonstrates the depth of the problem. It also shows the extent to which anti-blackness has been normalized globally because even amid a humanitarian crisis, there was still the time and space for discrimination against Africans and other persons of color. For instance, in Moldova, the private sector proactively sought to help Ukrainian refugees with the telecommunications company Moldcell offering them free call, minutes, SMS, and free internet connectivity valid for five days. The Ukrainian crisis did bring back into public discourse global double standards in the racialized treatment of people fleeing the same war zone. It did confirm a long-standing public secret that the right to life, livelihood, security, and mobility of black bodies is always contested or negated. It is not a coincidence that black peoples, Afro-descendants and people of color generally are often unwanted, unwelcome, and perceived as a threat by the West and the rest. The Ukrainian police and soldiers who were preventing Africans from boarding trains to escape the war zone until all Ukrainians had boarded showed the often unstated but believed hierarchy of unequal humanity. These soldiers and police officers acted as they did because they had been taught that Africans, or black people generally, who tried to flee tragedy were not worth saving. This is not only a gross human rights violation, but a slap in the face given the solidarity that African states did show toward Ukraine during the crisis. Starting with the viral speech by Kenya's permanent representative to the United Nations, Ambassador Martin Kimani, who passionately called out Russia's neo-colonial ambition to forcefully reintegrate people divided by past empires, and even Jean Beleniuk, who wouldn't allow his racial experiences from Ukrainians dissuade his loyalty to Ukraine, was seen on that eve of the invasion calling on Ukrainians to keep calm and not give in to panic. Later on, he posted images of himself on Facebook and Instagram cleaning a Soviet-era pistol, suggesting he was preparing to fight. Racially motivated attacks occur in Ukraine while police and courts do little to intervene, the Council of Europe said in a report made public February 2008 in Strasbourg. The report also expressed concern about attacks against rabbis and Jewish students, as well as the vandalism of synagogues, cemeteries and cultural centers. However, criminal legislation against racially motivated crimes has not been strengthened, and the authorities have not yet adopted a comprehensive body of civil and administrative anti-discrimination laws, the body said. There have been very few prosecutions against people who make anti-Semitic statements or publish anti-Semitic literature. 
discrimination against the Romani community, continuing anti-Semitism, violence in Crimea and other acts of intolerance against various ethnic groups in Ukraine were singled out in the report by the Council of Europe's Racism Monitoring Body, the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance. For instance, in December 2006, racist attacks on foreign students were reported by the Council of Europe. The Council stated that students were reluctant to report attacks because police response to these attacks seemed to be inadequate. Many of these incidents are conducted by skinheads or neo-Nazis in Kyiv, but similar crimes have also been reported throughout the country. Skinheads, known as white power skinheads, are members of a neo-Nazi, white supremacist and anti-Semitic offshoot of the skinhead subculture. Many of them are affiliated with white nationalist organizations and some of them are members of prison gangs. This movement emerged in the United Kingdom between the late 1960s and the late 1970s, before spreading across Eurasia and North America in the 1980s to 1990s. This movement has got to do with the mob section behind most racially motivated violent attacks and crises that you've heard of. In addition to incidents of assault, persons of African or Asian heritage may be subject to various types of harassment, such as being stopped on the street by both civilians and law enforcement officials. Individuals belonging to religious minorities have also been harassed and assaulted in Kyiv and throughout Ukraine. To say the least, being a black in Ukraine has been gravely wounding, and in all of this, the government's response to the recent surge in hate crimes has been insufficient and inconsistent. Ex-President Viktor Yushchenko and some other senior government officials have spoken out against racist and xenophobic violence. However, these statements have been undermined by other declarations by some key law enforcement officials whose remarks suggested a denial of the problem. Since 2005, non-governmental NGO monitors in Ukraine have documented a dramatic rise in violent crimes with a suspected bias motivation. While incidents occurring in Kyiv have been most accurately documented, there is evidence that incidents of violence are taking place throughout the country, including the cities of Cherkasy, Chernivtsi, Kharkiv, Luhansk, Vinnytsia, Zhitomir, and several others against people of color. A report released by Amnesty International in July 2008 had warned of an alarming rise in racist attacks in Ukraine. According to the report, more than 60 people were targeted in racist violence in 2007, six of them killed. More than 30 people were victims of racist attacks since the beginning of 2008, and at least four had been killed at the time of the report. Rights advocates are puzzled by the rise in hate crimes, but they claim government inaction is partly to blame. They also claim the government aggravates the problem by denying that racism is growing and only acknowledging isolated incidents. Rights groups claim Ukrainian hate groups are inspired by their counterparts in Russia. Russian skinheads help the local groups, they say, sharing tips and video clips on how to attack and torture their victims and how to safely leave the crime scene. Representatives of the Ministry of Justice and members of Ukrainian parliament stated that discrimination views and anti-social attitudes are practiced by a minority of the population, by fringe organizations and by younger generations of Ukrainians. They say they are most alarmed by the younger Ukrainians' attitudes. But wait a minute. Aren't certain attitudes of younger generations inherited from older generations? Aren't the racist attitudes of these younger Ukrainians picked up from their older generations over time? Or is there anywhere else aside from one's surroundings that younger ones pick up mentality from? Nonetheless, the fact that during the 2007 parliamentary elections, the right-wing parties espousing xenophobic and racist ideology did receive very little support from the electorate, also points to the unpopularity of such ideas among the general Ukrainian population. According to a Western human rights organization, asylum seekers, refugees, students and labor migrants are among the victims of bias-motivated violence, which have also included diplomats, expatriate employees of foreigner companies, members of visible minorities in Ukraine, and Ukrainians who have assisted hate crime victims. Foreign students, of which there are some 40,000, have been among the principal victims of hate crimes. Small populations of citizens and immigrants of African origin are highly visible and particularly vulnerable targets of racism and xenophobia. Although relatively few people of African origin reside in Ukraine, the rate of violence against this group has been extraordinary. African refugees, students, visitors, and the handful of citizens and permanent residents of African origin have lived under constant threat of harassment and violence. Terrell Starr, independent scholar and journalist from New York, 
carried out some kind of research several years ago on the experiences of the African Ukrainians and the black community living in Ukraine. Eventually, the information Starr had gathered during this research culminated in a photo exhibition he produced, which consisted of his interview subjects' experiences. Major part of Starr's research included questions designed to allow interviewees to explore the issues of race and identity in their own context. Here they are asked about their experiences as African Ukrainians while attending Ukrainian schools. As Starr would further reveal, that was the first time anyone had asked them in depth about their experiences, so the result was enormous which led Starr to this particular curious character he had interviewed in the process, Angelina Diash, a university student of Angolan and Ukrainian descent. Born and raised in Ukraine, although Diash viewed other Ukrainians as her fellow citizens, the feeling was not always reciprocated. At this point, Diash has said, For instance, although I have a passport that shows I'm Ukrainian, but I need a social visa... Angelina Diash had developed a strong sense of self-identity because of her difference in appearance. She had also developed a sense of self-reliance at an early age to cope with being a minority in her own country. When a person is constantly singled out by race, you grow to know just who you are very quickly. This, the African-American journalist Terrell Starr, had said while discussing his research as a Fulbright scholar in Ukraine at a May 2011 Kennan Institute event. Starr had hinted further that the research in itself was an eye-opener for him to literally experience firsthand that racism and xenophobia are very well active in Ukraine. The African-American speaker explained that he was stopped by Ukrainian police 29 times during his stay in Kyiv. Although the presence of racism and xenophobia has been on the rise in Ukrainian society, Starr had said, improvement is not unfathomable. However, he had noted that effective social change must come from above. What I found in Ukraine, Starr concluded, is that you have to find a combination of political leaders who actually try to deal with the problem. In closing, we have peeled back the gilded veneer of a crisis to expose the raw wound of racism that festers beneath. For too long, the narrative has been painted in shades of blonde and blue, erasing the vibrant tapestry of black experience in Ukraine. We were here before the bombs fell, not as refugees, but as students, professionals, building lives, weaving dreams into the very fabric of Ukraine as a nation. Yet the iron fist of war revealed a different truth. We were denied at the borders, deemed an afterthought in the desperate scramble for safety. But hear this, we are not phantoms fading into the background. We are doctors, scholars, artists, the beating heart of a diverse Ukraine. This is not a call for pity, but a roar for recognition. We will not be silenced by the deafening indifference, nor will we be fractured by the cracks of prejudice. Let this be a turning point. Let the world see the mosaic of Ukraine, where black excellence is celebrated, not ostracized. Hear our voices, for they are the clarion call of a new era. An era where equality is not a distant dream, but the cornerstone of this society. Let this be a watershed moment, a turning point where the color of our skin is no longer a barrier, but a badge of honor. We are black in Ukraine, and our story is only beginning. This brings us to the end of yet another interesting video segment here. Did you happen to learn a thing or two in the ride? Then reach out to us in the comment section below and share your thoughts with us. We are always delighted to hear what you think and pick from them. Also, don't forget to support our works by hitting on that like button in front of you. Share with your families and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative. And kindly subscribe to keep getting notified on more edifying contents in the way. We are very glad to have you. Thank you for watching.